Welcome back to another episode of Rock Boys Football, Lincoln Riley, the USC Trojans winding down fall camp and we're getting another interior defensive lineman that is starting to emerge during the back half of fall camp and sounds to be a contributor for this USC team on the inside of the defensive line. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the emergence of Kobe Pepe, which I think is massive for this USC program. Now you fast forward two weeks, you know, Devin Tompkins is generating a lot of buzz as well. Devin Tompkins, I think a fascinating storyline where, you know, when Devin Tompkins committed to USC in that 2022 class, he was as a senior in high school, he was probably a better basketball player than he was football player. USC takes him because of the traits that he had. We knew that Devin Tompkins wasn't going to be a day one, year one contributor, probably wasn't even going to be a year two contributor like you saw some other defensive linemen. A guy like Cam Fount, we expect to be a day one contributor. That being said, we said with Devin Tompkins, if he hits, if he puts it together, this could be a very fun defensive lineman for this USC unit. It sounds like he might be putting it together. Want to talk about what role Devin Tompkins is going to play, what where he kind of fits into the USC rotation. I also have a couple of other, uh, you know, kind of storylines, position battles, some guys that are breaking out that I would like to cover as well. Really excited to get into it. Now, before we do it, as always, just want to say thank you to you guys and to the USC fans all off season long. You know, whether we're talking the recruiting trail, whether we're previewing 2024, talking the transfer portal, the amount of support consistently you guys have shown in the middle of the summer. It's been absolutely amazing. Y'all know I love talking this program. Appreciate you guys. If y'all do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel. And of course, would love to hear from y'all in the comments section. Not necessarily just about Devin Tompkins, but some of the other storylines that we're going to talk about as well. Again, I, I learn a ton from you guys. You guys do a great job of giving me some input and kind of giving me a lot of ideas about this USC program as well. So let it fly in the comments section. Without further ado, let's start with Devin Tompkins. And I think you got to start with just the body transformation. This kid was 6'5", I think, 230 pounds soaking wet heading into his senior year. He's up to 285 pounds heading into year three within this USC program. And it sounds like from a physicality standpoint, he's put it together. That was always the question with Devin Tompkins. This kid was long. He was extremely athletic. You take a look at the basketball highlights. There was no question why USC decided to bet on Devin Tompkins. This kid's a special caliber athlete. I think the big question was, one, where is he going to play on the defensive line? Is he going to be an edge rusher? Is he going to be playing on the inside? And I think number two, and most importantly, is he going to have the physicality to play at the power five level. And I think he is starting to show that. Now, what role is Devin Tompkins going to play? I don't even know if he'll be into the two deep, but we've talked about this extensively for USC. There will be a lot of national media analysts get up there and say, yeah, USC's defensive line stinks. That's not true. The question mark that we have about USC's defensive line was, who's it going to be after Bear Alexander, Nate Clifton? You look at that interior defensive line duo and say, probably one of the better units that you'll see in the Big Ten Conference. I mean, we think Bear Alexander is going to be one of the better interior defensive linemen we see in the country heading into 2024. Nate Clifton has played a ton of football in the SEC. The conversation that we've had a lot was not this USC defensive line stinks, doesn't have talent. The conversation was, all right, when Bear Alexander comes off the field, which he's going to have to at times in 2024, is there going to be a significant drop-off in play on the inside of the defensive line? And as we continue to hear about guys emerging, whether it's Gavin Mayer, the transfer from Wyoming, whether it's Kobe Pepe, whether it's Devin Tompkins, we start to, or Carlin Jones, true freshman, probably should throw him in there as well. We start to feel a little bit better about the depth on the inside of the defensive line. That was always the question. The talent level for USC on the defensive line, it was never the question. The question was the depth. Do we have guys that can come in for Bear Alexander and provide good snaps? We're starting to feel better about that. Now, what role does Devin Tompkins play? It's going to look a little bit different than Kobe Pepe, right? Kobe Pepe is that that nose that's going to be two-gapping, eating up double teams, letting his linebackers play free. Really important role in the USC defense, but not necessarily going to fill up the stat sheet. I think Devin Tompkins can be a little bit more of a, a stat sheet stuffer, if you will, at that three-tech position. He's not going to play nose because he's only 285 pounds. He's 6'6". It's hard for him to play with great leverage, but what he can do is really challenge interior offensive linemen from a length and athleticism standpoint. Again, this kid is extremely long. He's a very fluid, athletic, twitchy athlete. 
he's a guy that can give you some juice in the pass rush. He's a guy that can penetrate, get behind the line of scrimmage, and kind of be just a disruptor, as opposed to someone like Kobe Pepe, who's not going to be getting behind the line of scrimmage, giving you a ton of pass rush juice. So that's kind of the role that I think Devin Tompkins will play for USC. And again, I think USC could use more negative plays in the emergence of Devin Tompkins as a guy that you know might even just be a pass rush specialist for USC in 2024. That that matters for USC. The more names that we hear garner some buzz on the inside of the defensive line, the better we feel about USC's depth on the inside of the defensive line. Now, going to another storyline, I want to talk about Eric Gentry. Now, the USC fans are probably sick and tired of me talking about Eric Gentry. I continue to be impressed with what I read, but more importantly, just the excitement continues to build for me. I think it starts with Eric Gentry being the healthiest he's been in his college football career. I mean, I can't remember a couple months span where Eric Gentry has been kind of a full go throughout fall camp spring practice. Eric Gentry, I don't think missed a practice. That's a really big storyline. You go back to the last couple of years with Eric Gentry transferring over from Arizona state. It's always been all right, a couple of good weeks and then goes down with an injury. Doesn't play for a couple of weeks. And it's just never been the consistency has never been there. And so Eric Gentry, first and foremost, being healthy, playing fast and physical, that's a massive storyline. I think secondly, I continue to get excited about his leadership role and the role that he's going to play within this USC defense where Alex Grinch just didn't really seem to know how he wanted to use Eric Gentry. And I don't even know if Eric Gentry is going to start at the linebacker spot, right? Easton Mascarenas, Arnold, Mason Cobb, probably your projected starters. That being said, Eric Gentry is going to play. And he provides a unique skill set that Mason Cobb and East Mascarenas Arnold don't have. You could probably make the argument that he balances out those two linebackers extremely well. And so is Eric Gentry going to play a ton of football when USC plays a team like Iowa or Minnesota or Nebraska, teams that are going to run the football, play two tight end sets? No, probably not because that's not necessarily his wheelhouse. But when USC plays some of those faster athletic teams that want to get you in space, that's probably where Eric Gentry plays. You talk about Eric Gentry as a pass rusher. There are so many different things that Eric Gentry can do. And I felt like Alex Strinch just kind of pigeonholed him into an off-ball linebacker spot where I look at more Eric Gentry as being a defensive chess piece, not just the linebacker, a guy that you can move all over the formation, whether it's that overhang linebacker spot, whether it's coming off the edge. A lot of different things Eric Gentry can do, a lot of skill sets and value that he brings to this USC defense. And I think to hear him, again, fast, physical, healthy, that's first and foremost most important because we know it's that's kind of been the talking point with Eric Gentry. But more importantly, you know how Dan Lynn decides to use Eric Gentry within this defense. Now, going over to the offensive side of football where, again, we're, we feel really dang good about this secondary. I think a couple storylines that I want to focus on, one is the tight end play, which is, garnering a lot of excitement within a lot of USC fans. I think this is a really big storyline that we haven't talked a ton about. You look at the tight end room. One of the things that I think is most important for USC at tight end is in the red zone. You go back to 2023, USC was solid. They were 32nd in the country in red zone scoring, which honestly is not that good when you compare it to every other statistic for USC's offense the last two years. That being said, you go to USC and the success they had in the red zone it did seem to be a lot of Caleb Williams kind of doing it himself, kind of ad-libbing a little bit, that Miller Moss is just not his skill set. And so you look at USC trying to have success in the red zone. One, I think the run game is going to be absolutely massive. We've been very vocal that this run game could be very good for USC. But more importantly, when the space starts to get small, the throwing windows are less wide open. It's going to be harder for guys like Mikhail Lemon and Zachariah Branch to really excel in that red area. You have guys like Jacoby Lane and Deuce Robinson who are certainly going to help. But I think having a tight end that can be that matchup nightmare, that big physical pass catching presence in that red area is going to be massive. And I got to give a massive shout out to Lake McCree. I've probably been a little bit, not disrespectful to Lake McCree, but I've been talking a lot more about the young tight ends in this room. You know, Lake McCree has been within this program for a very long time. And when USC kind of had those dead periods where coaches weren't allowed to work with the young tight ends, from what you're hearing, you know, Lake McCree would have all the tight ends in the film room, teaching them the playbook. This young tight end room, you know, whether it's Lions, whether it's Joey Olson, whether it's Walter Matthews, it's a very exciting, dynamic tight end group. Joey Olson probably being my favorite. The fact that Lake McCree has kind of been coaching these guys up and getting them ready from a mental standpoint in terms of understanding the playbook 
that's a really big storyline. And if you can get good tight end play from some of these young tight ends, I think that's just another way this USC offense can attack opposing defenses. Now it starts with the wide receivers, right? They are just, it's a really young, talented group. But if you can add that that tight end, that can be that matchup nightmare, that can command the, the middle of the field, that's a really big addition to this USC defense. I think the last conversation we have to have is the continued position battle at right guard, where I think a lot of USC fans, I certainly fall into this category, and kind of penciled in Alani Noah as the starter at the right guard spot. We kind of knew what the starting five was going to be, and although I think it's still going to be Alani Noah come week zero, week one, not week zero, it is kind of interesting that you're having some other guys are pushing Alani Noah. I think there's two ways that you can read into this position battle. Either one is the negative way, which is, all right, Alani Noah hasn't really grasped this right guard position. The other way you could read into this is, hey, we have some other guys like Gino and Amos that are really starting to step up. And I think if you read it the second way, the more positive way, that bodes very well for the depth of this USC offensive line where, all right, we are comfortable is starting Alani Noah. But the fact that Gino and Amos are starting to push Alani Noah means they're ready too. And so if you were to have to shuffle the deck a little bit, move some guys around, you feel good about the depth on the inside of the offensive line. And so yeah, you could read it negatively and say, all right, Alani Noah, maybe not uh, taking over the position, if you will. You could also read into it and say, hey, that's really good news for a guy like Gino who has played, has not played a ton of football, but with been within this USC program for a very long time. And then a guy like Amos, who we knew would take a year to kind of get that body right as just this big, burly offensive lineman coming out of high school, maybe he's starting to put it together. And I think if you're a USC fan, you probably still want Alani Noah to be that starter because I think he kind of fits what USC is going to want to do, and that is move people off the line of scrimmage and run the football. I think Alani Noah and Amos are a little bit more physically imposing than a guy like Gino. And I think secondly for Gino, I think he's the ideal six man off the bench. You know I mean? Gino can play left guard, can play right guard, potentially could play center. Having that utility guys, your six man is always a massive, massive, uh, it's an advantage for defenses. And I think having Gino as that utility guy would probably be fit in best within this USC offensive line. So I don't think it's time to panic on Alani Noah. I think it could mean that, hey, guys like Amos and Gino are really starting to put it together during fall camp. Hey, we're going to get a lot of these answers, these questions answered 14 days from now when USC kicks off against LSU. Wanted to hop bomb, talk about some of the last trickling in storylines, if you will, about this USC program. We'll cut it there. Appreciate you guys rocking with the boys. Again, all the support over the offseason. It's meant the absolute world. If you guys do enjoy the content, consider subscribing to the channel, and we'll talk to you all later.